Hello and welcome to Physician Spotlight. I am your host, Vikram Christian. Physician Spotlight is a forum for us to learn more about our physician leaders in the field of nutrition. We are very grateful to Aspen and our viewers for making this possible. In today's episode, I have the privilege of talking to Dr. Justine Turner. Dr. Turner is the professor in the Department of Pediatrics and the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. Dr. Turner, Justine, thank you for spending your time here today. Thank you for inviting me, Vikram. So Justine, I thought we would start off by talking a little bit about uh, just your interest in nutrition, like how did this come about? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can very distinctly remember when I first got interested in, in nutrition and it was kind of um, in concert with an interest in gastroenterology. So I, uh, I was a medical resident on the wards and one of the patients had hypernatremia and gastroenterology was consulted and I remember Dick Hill was the gastroenterologist in Perth who came to do the consult and I remember him walking me through the physiology very very carefully to explain you know what was the cause of the hyponatremia and what we would do to manage it and what the risks were and I just remember feeling at that time oh this is the best thing in medicine right and this is all about nutrition and metabolism and physiology and that's where I want to go so um, so I, I, I think those are the things that drew me to nutrition is that that basic aspect of physiology that covers everything um, mm -hmm. but you know people with a good grounding in nutrition know how to manage so that's excellent thank you for sharing that um, you mentioned Perth. So uh, is that where you did your training? Can you tell us more about your yeah, training? Yeah, so I did my medical school and then six years of medicine in Perth. And then I did my um, FRACP, so my fellowship as a pediatrician. Um, and then um, during that time when I was a registrar, uh, that would be like an R4 resident uh, in North mm -hmm. America, um, I did rotate through the gastroenterology boards. And I think that was something I felt... Um, for me, of all of the specialties I'd been rotating through it, that was one that clicked the most. And our gastroenterology unit in Perth at that time was very, very unique because we admitted and did nutritional rehabilitation for girls with anorexia nervosa. Mm -hmm. um, I say girls because, you know, I, I don't, I've seen boys with eating disorders at different times, but really at the time I was there, it was only girls. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I remember just the whole process of nutritional rehabilitation, um, the, uh, I guess the teamwork, the multidisciplinary team, because we had a very, very integrated multidisciplinary team with very clear boundaries around who managed, managed the medical needs and who managed the psychological needs, um, mm -hmm. really drew me to nutrition. So it was sparked from, uh, gastroenterology all the way through. So I went into GI ultimately because I wanted to do nutrition, to be honest. Wow, that's that's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, as a fellow pediatric gastroenterologist, like, you know, I feel that definitely nutrition was a, a big motivating factor for me to also choose my career. Yeah. Um, now, um, thinking to your medical school education and, you know, residency, um, do you, what do you feel about the nutrition training that you got? Did you have like a curriculum where you did your training? No, I, I don't. Rec I mean, there may have been, but I don't recall a curriculum at all. I recall learning about failure to thrive during pediatrics. I can't mm -hmm. even, to be honest, recall about learning about malnutrition during my, um, you know, my undergrad when and as an intern, right? And I don't remember thinking about. <laughs> no, and I, I obviously my memory could be pretty bad now, but um, I just think that it was just not covered and discussed enough, particularly mm -hmm. in the adult side of my training. I mean, and gosh. Let's be fair, that was like over 20 years ago, so let's be fair. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I, I just remember it being a big gap. And I remember when I started my PhD um, and really had to read a lot, you know, around nutrition and the history of nutrition support and the history of malnutrition, but just being mm -hmm. so excited about it and wondering why this had never been taught to me before, right? So you could understand the fundamentals of how nutrition was integral, not just to your health, but to your brain function and your psychology mm -hmm. and, you know, all those mm -hmm. other aspects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I found, um, you know, great about your background, Justine, is your PhD in nutrition. Um, I think that's such a, um, must have been a really good experience. Can you tell me more? Uh, first of all, tell me, I guess, at what point in your career did you feel like that was necessary and how did that contribute to your career? Well, I think, I think there's two aspects to that. First of all, um, 
I think the other thing I developed a pretty big passion about during my undergrad and postgrad training was research. So mm -hmm. um, I was involved in a research study very early on, um, actually through the emergency department when I was a paediatric resident. And um, it was one of the first trials of budesonide for croup. And it was, you know, it was published in the British Medical Journal. And I had a very little role as the resident collecting the data, but it was so exciting. And I thought, mm -hmm. Definitely, I want to do more of this. So I knew I wanted to do more research even before I went into my GI training. And then when I went into my GI training and, you know, I had opportunity to do research as the, res the res registrar on the eating disorders team and to see mm -hmm. how much research was needed and how much better understanding of malnutrition and refeeding was needed, it was a pretty easy decision for me to want to do a PhD. I think the decision is easy. It's the sticking at it that's the hard bit. So, you know, many more people start a PhD than finish a PhD. 100%. It was hard to stick at it. I actually had um, my first child before I'd finished my PhD. I started my fellowship before I'd finished my PhD. I mean, I'm so glad that I did finish it. It's been, um, you know, I do think it is unique. There are too few of us that have PhDs in nutrition science and mm -hmm. as physicians, lots of um, non-physician nutrition scientists, but as a physician, mm -hmm. so, and, you know, and as RDs is similar, right? There's too few of us. So I, I'm glad I finished it, but it was a bit of a slog to get it finished at the end, to be honest. Wow. And um, from what I understand, that spark of nutrition that, you know, I guess started some time ago, still continues to be um, I guess, active in your life. I know that research is a yeah. big part of your career right now. Can you tell yeah. us more about what you're working on? Yeah, so I, um, my job description, I have 40% time for research and 35% uh, time for clinical. So I do more research than um, clinical, essentially, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say, you know, research for me is probably the most exciting aspect of, of my daily life. And um, I think everybody has to have something they're passionate about in their in their mm -hmm. job and in their career, right? And I think, you know, they, there's lots of evidence for that, that that helps prevent burnout and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. right? You have to feel that this is the thing that you're most excited about in the day so that when you have mundane tasks, you can mm -hmm. go back to doing the exciting thing. So my, when my research current, like my, PhD was clinical research. I looked at bone density um, in anorexia nervosa and the effect of renutrition uh, it, for bone mass. Um, but And then I did kind of a hybrid when I was at Sick Kids. I did a postdoc with Paul Pencharts and I did um, amino acid metabolism. So it was kind of a hybrid between some basic aspects of research and clinical research. And mm -hmm. then when I came here to Alberta, I run a translational animal lab. So it's much more basic science. Um, so my background and training, you know, I've learned a lot on the job because I didn't have that basic a a science aspect. But I I think if you have good grounding in nutrition and in research training, you can take on basic science research as well. Um, so we, we, our animal model is an animal model of short gut, which I know interests mm -hmm. you. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we've looked at various things. Mostly we've looked at growth factors for adaptation. We've looked at TPN lipids. Um, we have looked a little bit, I'd li I like to look more at enteral nutrition. We looked a little bit at that. So we've used that model really to answer clinical questions to try and really make it translatable. So even though it's a basic science model, I think the mm -hmm. way we approach it, um, Paul Wales and I as my research partner is very clinically orientated actually. Excellent. Um, and you mentioned a little bit about your clinical practice here. Um, can you tell me more about, I guess, what you see in clinical practice over there? Mm. So in my clinical practice, I do, um, in my ambulatory practice, I mainly do celiac disease. And I do do some mm. research, uh, particularly into the gluten-free diet with a collaborator here, Diana Major. Um, and she's a she's an RD PhD, and she's been a wonderful collaborator. Um, I, I'm the medical director for our home enteral nutrition program, um, and that's been a wonderful experience. Um, but is predominantly an administrative role, but a little bit of a clinical role there as well. Um, and then I do a bit of general GI, and then my inpatient service, we look after liver transplant, multivisceral transplant, intestinal transplantation, um, and we do consultative GI. So I'm kind of a bit broad. I do a little bit of everything. We don't have mm -hmm. a focused um, nutrition support team here, um, but obviously, you know, nutrition is integrated into everything that I do, and I do teach our, our nutrition curriculum here. 
All right, thank you for sharing that, Justine. Now, given your background here, I, I know that you've done some training in Australia and now you're working in Canada. Um, just thoughts on, I guess, healthcare delivery through different systems. Obviously, there's mm -hmm. going to be pros and cons in each system, but what are your thoughts and what you've experienced so far? Yeah, um, I have thought about this a bit because the Australian system is a bit of a hybrid system. We have um, a hybrid between private practice and public medicine. Um, and so the advantages of that as I see it or saw it, and I'm sure it may be different now because I left so long ago, is access is a huge advantage. We had a very high quality um, a public system as well, but one of the concerns or the risks of having a public private system is that the private system can sometimes deplete some of the experience from the public system. So some of you know, the best surgeons, for example, would rather do their private practice than work in a public system. That was always the concern. I didn't see it to a great degree when I was there, but I think it can definitely happen. Um, in Canada, we only have a public system. So there are some advantages for that for sure in terms of like you know recently I was involved in a quality assurance program for pediatric feeding disorders and we really took a provincial provincial approach to create guidelines and pathways that would be used across the province so mm -hmm. you can really standardize care from an evidence-based point of view in in a, in a public system you can focus on what is the evidence for best care delivery you know it, it, and what is cost effective right mm -hmm. um, but access can sometimes be a problem, and I do see that sometimes as a concern. But then um, it's I think a lot of healthcare systems are struggling with access on the costs of healthcare, mm -hmm. especially as we have aging populations. So I don't think our public system is unique that way, but I had the privilege of seeing the private system sometimes siphon off, siphon off some of those wait lists when I was in Australia. Um, let's switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about Aspen. I know you're very involved in Aspen and um, you were chair of the research committee for Aspen as well. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with an Aspen and um, what's that look yeah. like for you? Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm very grateful to have been involved in Aspen. I mean, I was brought that way really by colleagues like Paul Wales who were already involved um, when I started my interest in short gut and research. And, you know, for me, there could be no better home for my clinical interests and my research interests than Aspen because like really mm -hmm. what, what I'm most interested about is the delivery of nutrition support, right, both in my clinical practice and in um, my research with the animal model. Um, so having been brought into to Aspen um, and becoming a part of Aspen, it's just be, created huge opportunities for me, right? Opportunities to collaborate, opportunities to present my data, to have my students present my data and be successful and get awards. And they love Aspen. And it's a meeting that I can reliably take them to that I know they're going to learn about intestinal failure and nutrition. And so, you know, all of that's fantastic. Um, and then I have had the opportunity um, to be on the research committee, which was very, you know, helpful for me also in my, my research career here, because um, that's a very prestigious role. I was a the chair that was a while ago now and since then I've been the chair of the publication uh, education committee and that's also been a great opportunity to meet people and to look about and to look in more detail about how Aspen wa wants to educate and support the education of its members uh, you mm -hmm. know ultimately that's what good societies do right they're working to improve um the, you know, the quality of care for patients um, mm -hmm. and to support the members from different disciplines in doing that, right? And I think Aspen does a fantastic job of that. Absolutely. And I know that, uh, Justine, you've also been the recipient of the George Black for an award for mentorship in 2022. Uh, tell us a little bit about mentorship in your life. Yeah, I was, I was um, very surprised and grateful to win that award. Um, I don't, you know, it's a research mentorship award and I don't have a very, I have a very small research lab. That's the nature of doing uh, piglet work is it's very expensive. So it's difficult to have multiple graduate students that you have to find you know, resources to pay for all their salaries. So we tend to have a very small lab um, at any given time, but we've had very mm. successful graduate students. And I, I do think that's, you know, you know, because of the way that um, 
I approach mentorship for them. Like I know my own graduate experience that um, the whole experience of being nurtured, career planning, having the opportunities to go to meetings, to present, um, you know, to have a little bit of independence. They were all features of my own training and I wanted to bring them to my training of research uh, students here. But it was probably most exciting to me that the award, well, the way the letters were written to me, it wasn't given to me simply because of my research trainees, but because of my interest in nutrition training across the board. And, you know, we spoke about nutrition curriculums, you know, being lacking, um, not always being a priority for medical schools that have to fit so much in and maybe don't realise, you know, how critically important it is to make nutrition a key part of everything. Um, so I do a lot of medical student teaching. I teach dietitians, I teach nurses. Um, and I think that, you know, that mentorship and training and teaching be beyond our specialty, so beyond GI and beyond my G, my research trainees in my lab um, is really, really important if we want to bring um, nutritional care forward and keep it focused on. And I think that the um, committee, the award committee recognised that and were very grateful for my training beyond just my research trainees. So I, that was a, a nice aspect of winning that award. That's excellent. And uh, Justine, I, I don't know if I shared with you prior that um, I was part of the NASP began NTU program and um, you were the faculty during that year. And uh, so you have also played an integral part in my own nutrition education. So Aww. thank you for that. No, you're welcome. Um, so Justine, before we enter, any words of advice for young faculty and trainees in the field of nutrition? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have... Um... Three things that I would say. I mean, the first thing I would definitely say is find mentors and with an emphasis on the S, right? It doesn't have to be just one person who is your mentor. It's important to find mentors at different stages of your career, maybe mentors for different aspects of your career. Like you can have a research mentor, a clinical mentor, a uh, um, managing life mentor like you know we and we all do right we all have these different people but they are so critical I mean for me um, I, I don't think I would be here if it wasn't for uh, you know David Forbes was my first mentor in WA who really inspired me to do nutrition um, and to do a PhD I mean he really was the impetus for that and then Paul Penchart's was my mentor in Sick Kids, who I really credit with making me a better researcher. He, he's a superb researcher and he's a superb mentor because he's not a hand holder. He always uh, gives people prompts, but room for growth. The mm -hmm. second thing I would say is um, be adaptable. Um, mm -hmm. I, um, when I went to Sick Kids to do um, uh, my GI training there, my plan was to go back to WA and to do nutrition there. And, you know, the job opportunities there dried up. And I remember th feeling like that was the end of the world, right? You know, that one mm -hmm. event was the end of the world when you're early in your career. And Paul mm -hmm. Penchart saying to me, you know, when one door closes, another door opens and, um, you know, people go down different paths all the time. And he was absolutely right, because that's when the opportunity to come to Alberta here and work in the piglet lab and do research there, which I've been so excited about, um, happens. So I think it is, it is very true not to be discouraged, but to keep an open mind because mm -hmm. there will always be different paths you can take and there will always be lots of opportunities, more than we realise because of the nature of our profession, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think the last, you know, I, I, I would say on the background of that, though, is choose doors that lead in directions you want to go. It, by that, what I mean is, um, you know, my interest and my passion was nutrition and I ended up doing that in Alberta and not WA. Um, I wouldn't, you know, sometimes you, you, you have to feel really good about what you're doing. You have to feel passionate about it. But if the doors close, even in nutrition, there will be other doors that open. It's such a wide uh, mm -hmm. field, right? And there are so many different things we can do in this field. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing I would say is, you know, when you start, and I bet you got this advice, you know, people say to you, don't say yes to too many things. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to get tenure and you've got to do this and you've got to make time. You don't want to burn out. I, I would switch that around a little bit and, and say, sometimes it's good to say yes, you know, <laughs> and I think that's true of things, especially things related to societies. People don't recognize just how much a society can be a career mentor for you and can mm -hmm. really push your career in a good direction and give you lots of skills and collaborators and um, you know 
opportunities for awards and things that matter in your career path. So sometimes it's actually good to say yes sometimes to be on committees and things. Um, where, so I, I think the advice to say, oh, don't, don't say yes is not always right, but think strategically about what will this bring me and what will it bring my career? And my, I think what you give to societies you always get back. And so like all mm -hmm. the times I've volunteered for Aspen and Naspagan and Feeding Matters and other societies I'm involved in, I get back tenfold. So it's <laughs> definitely worth saying yes sometimes. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Justine. I, I can also attest that sometimes some of the more interesting things that I've done are things that I maybe would not have said yes to, but I did anyway and <laughs> turned out to be incredibly interesting. Thank you so much for sharing those words of advice. That was awesome. You're welcome. And uh, Justine, uh, thank you again for just, you know, spending this time here talking. It's been an honor to interview you here and just learn from your background, your perspective and experience. So thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Um, thank you. Hope to see you at Aspen here in yes. our national meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you will, you will. <laughs> awesome. Thank you again, Justine. And thank you so much to Aspen for making this possible. Agreed.